I am. Um, when I choose which talk I go to at a conference, I'm usually looking for something that um, I can't just Google and find a tutorial on. I, I like to keep things a little strange. So um, this talk is probably not going to be the sort of thing that you can just go back and start putting into your day job production code right away. But what I really want to leave you with are some ideas. I hope you're going to have a lot of fun here. I thank you for coming out. We know you have many choices of talks at your Star Trek conference, and we appreciate you choosing ours. Should, in the event of a waterborne landing, the exits are up into the back. OK, yep. Let's see how this does. OK, very good. They're my people. Incredibly strange people. Okay, I'm going to get started in about 10 seconds here. I'm going to get started in about 10 seconds here. All right, it's 2.15. It's time to get started. I'm Craig Stuntz, and I'm going to be talking to you about incredibly strange programming languages this afternoon. My slides are already online at speakerdeck.com slash Craig Stuntz. This, um, this talk is going to be, I hope, filled with interesting references to things you're going to want to look up later. And rather than writing all of them down, if you just write speakerdeck.com slash Craig Stuntz, uh, you'll find the slideshow. Alternately, if you find my, my Twitter account, I just tweeted the direct link to the slide deck so you can find it that way, which uh, I'm just at Craig Stuntz, uh, whichever is easier for you. So here's a spoiler alert for the talk. If, if you think that this sounds terrible, you should probably leave the auditorium right now. Uh, I'm going to give you a whirlwind tour of more than 10 different languages, and you're probably not going to walk out of here productive in all of them. I don't think that's possible, and it's not my goal. Um, learning interesting languages, though, can give you insight into how you might be writing code in 10 or 15 years. Um, and also, I'd like to suggest that Learning languages for their own sake can help you find new ways of solving problems in any language, in, including the types of languages that you're going to go back to work on Monday and use. My challenge to you when you leave this talk is to choose at least one of the languages that you see here that happens to tickle your fan fancy and Google it. Um, there are a couple of them that are kind of ungoogleable, but I'll, I'll provide you the links for those. Um, pick one really odd programming language that you've never heard of, dive into it, um, you know, spend an evening or two. I think it'll help you understand computation in a new light. 
because that's what this is really about. It's about understanding computation. Uh, we tend to think of computation in terms of silicon, but these are human computers. They are working at the uh, National Advisory Council on Aeronautics, or NACA, and um, this is the high-speed flight station computer room in 1949, but we're going to talk about computer science in doing a similar type of computing except on a computer. But I want to dispense with the obvious question first, like why bother? Um, today you can call yourself a full-stack developer if you know only JavaScript, and so why would you bother looking at any other language? That does it all. I mean, and Turing told us, right, that all languages, for the most part, are pretty much computationally equivalent, so what's the point? Well, languages are tools that we use to express the solutions to problems, and sometimes it's helpful to have more than one tool. I mean, some people would say that you can cook anything you want with just a good knife and a cast iron pan, and other people would say you can cook anything if you have a Ronco Vegematic. Um, you can certainly make delicious hummus using only a pot and a hammer, but if you want to start from dried chickpeas and have hummus in under an hour, you need a pressure cooker. So using the right tools for the job does matter. But also, we're probably going to do things differently in the future. Um, and the future of programming is not the year 2364. It's five or 10 years from now. Having said that, I, you know, I could tell you to look at other languages, and you might rightly come back to me and say, well, they all kind of look the same anyway. I mean, if I want to write a program to do something silly, like display the lyrics to 99 bottles of beer on the wall, um, I could write that program in C Sharp, or Ruby, or JavaScript, or C++, or Python, <laughs> and they all kind of look the same, don't they? So why do all these languages look so similar? There's many families of programming languages, and I know this is impossible to read, so don't worry about the details. Just take my word. There are a lot of languages up there, right? Um, the point is that the mainstream development that we do today with our Java and JavaScript and C Sharp, it uses a super small branch of this very big chart. Um, here's, I've simplified this a little bit. Um, this is, some would say, oversimplified uh, representation of the chart. So what does this tell us? Um, one thing that we see is that algal-based languages up here at the top are super common. Uh, we have Java and C Sharp and JavaScript and Ruby and C++. Um, they might not seem like the most similar languages, but they all come from the same programming language family. And then we see some historical uh, events that are sort of interesting. Um, in 1972 is a banner year for programming languages. We got the C language, ML, Prolog, and Sazzle. And a, sort of a similar thing happened in 1995 with Java and JavaScript and Ruby and PHP, some very popular languages that all, uh, that all came out in about the same time. And recently, um, you know, in the last couple of years, at the very far end here, we've seen this resurgence of ML languages with things like Swift and F Sharp. And so why are these waves, why do they exist? And is there going to be another, another wave of new languages coming in the not so distant future? It seems like we're kind of due for it. Um, mainstream programmers don't tend to change languages very often, but it does happen. And it's instructive to consider the reasons why. So again, this is an overgeneralization, but it's a starting point for discussion. In the 1950s, programmers used assembler because it was easier than machine code, and compilers, for the most part, hadn't uh, been invented yet. Um, in the 1960s and the 70s, we saw the beginnings of very large-scale applications and the real advent of maintenance coding. Um, and then in the later 70s, we started programming on very small computers, uh, things that had less processing power and storage than the Wi-Fi-enabled light bulbs you buy today. And the programming language capabilities were similarly downscaled during that, uh, that, during that era. Um, then in the 90s, we started thinking about the web. And we started with some safer languages like Java and JavaScript that were memory safe. We did it for the wrong reasons. We were concerned about memory leaks. What we really should have been concerned about is security. But you know, we'll take it where we can get it. And we're going to see some changes again. A JavaScript is not the perfect language that we're all going to use until the end of time. 
Um, I don't know what the mainstream language of 2025 is going to be, but I'm going to show you some features that JavaScript's probably never going to have, uh, even in ECMAScript 6 or 7, and speculate on what we might see in the future. Um, when you heard the title, Incredibly Strange Programming Languages, like one natural thing to think about, right, is joke languages. And some of them are kind of funny. Uh, the thing up at the top of the screen here is a real language called low code. And I got a pretty good laugh out of it when it came out, but it didn't really make me think about programming any differently. It's just kind of funny. Um, what I'm after is something different. I want to find languages that teach me new approaches to common problems that I can use in my day-to-day -day work. Uh, even if I'm not implementing the co my code in that language, um, if you have a background in linguistics, there's a notion uh, called the Sapir-Whorf hypothesis, which is a controversial proposition that says the language that you speak might affect how you think. And for spoken languages, I think it, it's fair to say that's not a proven proposition. But I do believe in a fairly strong version of the Sapir-Whorf hypothesis insofar as programming languages, because the tools we use to describe algorithms definitely do affect our approaches to solving those algorithms. One question that's interesting to think about is, does it matter what you call language, what, what you call your language? Does it matter what the reserved words are in that language? Um, imagine that Matz had called Ruby Yukihiro. Would, would that make any difference? Um, possibly. So the answer might depend on the character set that's used. There are a lot of assumptions that we bake into our programming languages and tools and libraries. And one of the assumptions that we often don't think about very much is that we're going to write code in mostly ASCII text from left to right. Now, C Sharp has better Unicode support than some languages, but the language itself and the libraries are still ASCII. What's worse, though, is we program based on assumptions that are simply false, like the notion that characters and Unicode code units and code points are the same thing. But we can get away with that, right? Because, you know, our software is mostly used by English speakers or, well, if not English speakers, like maybe not Klingons, right? Um, however, increasingly our software is used by teenagers. And I have to tell you, emoji, uh, emoji they're ruining everything. We're just going to have to live with the realities of Unicode. It's not safe to presume that uh, code points and characters are the same thing. It's not safe to presume encodings. It's not safe to presume text direction. So it would be helpful to consider what happens when you abandon these assumptions entirely. I'm going to tell you about a language called ELB. Um, if you speak Arabic, you can come up to the podium after the presentation, and I can apologize for all the mispronunciations that are about to follow here. ELB is Arabic for heart. But it's also an Arabic recursive acronym for Elb Lugat Baramaja, which means heart, a programming language. It's designed by Ramsey Nasser. And roughly half a billion people in the, in the world speak Arabic. It's maybe not quite as many as English, but it's still pretty common. So, you know, why not have a programming language in Arabic? What could possibly go wrong? Well, it turns out a whole lot. Um, there's this technical bias in our tooling that favors left to right ASCII code, and you know GitHub doesn't even know what to do with the URLs when you when you write them in Arabic. Um, the web, at least, is Unicode. Um, well, mostly. Git diff doesn't work so well, <laughs> and you know what else doesn't work is your terminal. Um, any text editors you might use, like uh, Atom or Sublime, they don't handle right to left. Uh, typing correctly. And Ramsey said, you know, as he just faced layer on layer of adversarity from his tooling, as he tried to just write his code, um, it became an art project. So he said, you know what? I like art. Um, and so this is uh, the, the, the ELB source code for his uh, program to calculate the Fibonacci sequence, done as a traditional Kufic-style Kufic tile mosaic. Um, 
And he, he said, you know, what, what, let's, let's run with this thing and let's see what we, we turn up with. Um, mainstream languages tend to depend upon punctuation. It just doesn't work at all in the Arabic language. He had to get rid of things like curly braces and semicolons and commas. Um, but parentheses do, do uh, work in that language, so he used a lisp syntax. And if you have enough parentheses, you can do pretty well with a lisp. Um, I've added the translations on this side of the screen. Ramsey's, R Ramsey wrote a REPL for his language that works, um, but it's strictly Arabic. Uh, there's, there's no support for uh, non-Arabic speakers there. Um, already, you know, this is just the banner of the REPL, but we can see a couple of interesting things. So one thing that you see is the, the numbers here. We, we tend to call these things Arabic numerals, but here's what they actually look like in Arabic. Um, another thing you see is that this second line here is very short, um, but on the, on the Arabic side, it's a little more balanced. And one of the characteristics of the Arabic language is there are ligatures that you can insert to change the width of a word without changing its meaning. So as a programmer, if you are at all fastidious about lining up your code, this is brilliant because you can change how you write a reserved word without changing its meaning, just so that it lines up perfectly visually uh, in your code. So here's hello world in Elb. Um, the, the, the print command is say, and then it says hello world. And when you invoke that, the, the REPL duly responds, hello my world. Um, and here's a program to calculate the Fibonacci sequence. Um, we've defined the function here, and then we invoke it with that same say command. So invoke Fibonacci of 10, and it returns 55. Um, the language itself is a little less surprising than the fact that he got it to work at all, given such adversarial tooling. If you'd like to know more about it, um, you can go to his site. Um, if you don't have an Arabic keyboard, it's a little hard to type this URL, so you could just start at nas.sr and uh, click on through the link on the home page there. And uh, there are some videos that, that show uh, some, more, uh, some more programs that he's implemented in this language. Another um, assumption that you hear quite a lot is that all languages are equivalent in their computational power due to Turing completeness. Turing completeness is a somewhat misunderstood concept. Um, let's start with a definition. A Turing complete language is one that can implement any function whose values can be computed by an algorithm, a series of steps. And nearly all programming languages that you use today are Turing complete. But some language designers have experimented with some somewhat more limited languages. And why would you ever want that? This is a quote from a Hollywood movie, and it's fiction. The real Joan Clark had a double first degree in math from Cambridge, and she was too smart to ever say this. Um, Turing never claimed that his machines could solve any problem. He, he didn't say that, and to the contrary, his purpose was to prove that problems existed which the machines couldn't solve. That was why he, he designed a Turing machine. So I'm going to tell you about three languages with somewhat curious names, Bloop, Floop, and Gloop. Bloop is a non-Turing complete language. It's less powerful than the languages that you're going to use in your, in your day job. Um, the other two languages add additional features to Bloop to uh, add some more power. And all three of these come from Douglas Hofstetter's book called Gerdel Escherbach. Some of you might have read it. It was a pretty popular book in the 70s. Um, apparently, it became more popular than Kurt Gerdel himself, but I'm going to talk about chapter 13. This is Bloop, and if, for those of you who programmed in the 70s, this looks like a, a pretty standard 1970s programming language until you look at the looping constructs here. So this is a function to determine if uh, it, it's called prime, and it takes a single argument called n, and the goal of the function is to return yes or no, depending upon whether the argument is prime. So in Bloop, the, the functions that return a Boolean have a default value of no. So if I don't return anything, it's going to return no. And if I want to return yes, I'm going to assign yes to output. So what this function does is it says if, if the argument is 0, then we return no by default because 0 isn't prime. And then we iterate from 2 to n minus 2, 
and we attempt to divide n by each of those numbers. And if we, if we find any that, divi that divide evenly, then we're just going to quit and return the default value. And if we get through that entire loop, we're going to assume that the number is prime. And it's not the most efficient algorithm in the world, but it does get the job done. Um, the, the interesting thing here is that we were able to implement this, this algorithm in a language that is not Turing complete. If your loops have to have an upper bound and you have no other construct for arbitrary looping like uh, open recursion, then you have a non-Turing complete language in, in all likelihood. Um, and it turns out that you can implement a lot of useful algorithms in a non-Turing complete language. Um, but there are some, some algorithms that we would like to implement um, that require a bit more power. Like one function that would be really useful is a function which takes as its argument loop source code and evaluates it and returns the answer. And uh, I cannot implement that in loop itself. So I need a somewhat more powerful language. And this is called Floop. And Floop is just bloop. And it adds exactly one feature to the language, which is something called a mu loop. And a mu loop is something that just executes over and over and over. It's your while wow one loop. Um, and it just executes over and over until you, until you uh, explicitly quit, uh, should you remember to explicitly quit the loop. So this power comes at a very high price. All Floop, uh, I'm sorry, all Bloop programs are going to terminate with some kind of value. And that is not true of Floop. Some Floop programs terminate forever. It would be useful for me to know which ones were, are going to run forever and which ones are not. So I would ideally like to be able to write a program that, in the same way I evaluated the Bloop programs using Floop, um, I would like to write a program that looks at a Floop program and tells me what the result is going to be and if it is going to terminate. Um, but you can't do it. Um, this is Turing and Alonzo Church proved that you cannot uh, show the termination of, of a program in a Turing complete language. So Hofstetter proposes that what we need is a still more powerful language that can analyze a flute program and tell me if it's going to terminate. And he calls this bloop, and the slide is blank because bloop doesn't, ex I'm sorry, gloop doesn't exist. And these, these language names are quite confusing. Um, gloop does not exist and it can't exist. And, and sort of What's interesting here is not that it doesn't exist. What's interesting is the reason why it doesn't exist. Um, you would be the world's greatest mathematician if you had access to a language like Gloop. Because you could just write a function that performs the Collatz conjecture for some input, and you just look and see, does that thing terminate or not? And if it returned that it, that it did, in fact, terminate in all cases, well, you've just proved the Klotz conjecture, and you can go ahead and collect your million-dollar prize, right? Um, so Gloop turns out to be impossible. So it's obvious why you might want a Turing-complete language, and, and this is the reason why most of our languages turn out to be Turing-complete, is because you can, with a language like that, you can implement any algorithm you need. But maybe what's a little less clear is why you might want a, a, an incomplete language? Uh, why would you want a more, a more restricted language? Well, in some domains, decidability is a feature. So the C-sharp type system is Turing incomplete. And what that means is that the C-sharp compiler will always tell you that, yes, your program is valid and type checks, or no, it is not. The C-sharp compiler, as long as there are no bugs, it's never going to go, eh, I, I'm not sure. I'm going to think about this a little bit more. And that turns out to be a really useful feature. Um, this is not true of all programming languages, right? C++ templates are Turing complete. The Scala type system is Turing complete. And both of those co compilers can hang forever, or at least until you terminate, and never give you a, an answer as to whether or not your program is type safe or not. Um, Another application of where you might want a more limited language is cryptography. Um, in cryptography, it's really important that given a key and some ciphertext, you either decrypt the text or you return an error, and that you do that in the same amount of time. Cryptography has to be constant time, because if you do not make it constant time when there's an error or when there's not, what you've done is introduce something called a timing oracle. And a timing oracle can, use to be, can be used to break a crypto system. This is a difficult problem, and there are entire books on the subject. But one of the keys is choosing a subset of your language, which leads to deterministic execution paths. 
Yet another example of when you might want a Turing incomplete language is homomorphic encryption, which allows doing computations on encrypted data. I'm going to give you a really short summary of this. I have an hour-long presentation on the topic if you want to learn more. But the idea is I want to make a cloud service that does tax returns. And you might think my service is great, but you might be a little hesitant to give me all of your financial data and your payroll stuff and your bank accounts, right? Okay, so what you can do instead is you encrypt your financial data with a key that you keep. You give me only the ciphertext of, of, your, of your financial data, and my cloud service chews through that ciphertext and produces the ciphertext of your tax return using a key the service does not have. It hands that back to you where you can decrypt it. I have totally solved the privacy problem, but it sounds impossible. Um, and in fact, people were not sure if this was possible in a general sense until about seven years ago when a man named Craig Gentry proved that it was possible in his Stanford thesis. Um, I, I could talk for quite a while on this, but the long and the short of it is that the cloud service cannot branch based on the values in your data because it can't decrypt them. It doesn't have the key. So it has to perform its computations in a way that doesn't require knowing any of the values in your data. And how that works is a, a topic in and of itself. But it's another case where having a limited language that's not Turing complete turns out to be useful in the real world. If you'd like to learn more about this, I do recommend reading Gerdel Escherbach. It's a great book and it touches on a lot of other topics besides just the one from chapter 13 that I've discussed. When we look at source code, we can generally figure out the order in which things happen. Now, your language may have some features, like async features, that make this a little bit harder. But at least within a method, it should be pretty clear what's going on, right? Eh, maybe. I'm going to talk about laziness. What does it mean for a language to be lazy? Well, you've seen bits and pieces of this, right? This is C++, I'm sorry, this is C sharp. In C sharp, after this code runs, are there any missiles flying? Any C sharp programmers here? I see a shaking head. No, there are no missiles flying uh, after this code runs in C sharp. Um, we see a similar effect with enumerables. Um, it's maybe not entirely obvious in which order these statements are going to run. Can you look at this and figure out in which order these statements are likely to execute? You can't entirely be sure, because I haven't shown you the implementations of some of these things, but it's probably something like BCA. Okay? But for the most part, though, you can generally look at C-sharp code, and you can pretty much guess in which order things are going to happen. And you might need to make that guess in order to really figure out the behavior of the code. So Haskell, by contrast, is lazy by default. And th although the language is lazy, as the programmer, you might have to work a little harder. So let's think about what this might mean. So I wrote a function here in Haskell. It's called increment. There it is right there. It takes an argument called i. It writes a trace to the debug. And then it returns i plus 1. The last line of the function is what it returns. OK? And then in the main function, we um, have some variables here, inc1, inc2, inc3. And I, I call increment, of, and I pass the argument 1. I call increment and pass the argument 2 and 3. And then I'm going to print two of those in uh, reverse order. So I'm going to pr print to the console the value of inc3 and inc2. And the interesting thing comes when we look at the, the debug output here, we see that increment 3 was called first, increment 2 was called second, and increment 1 has never been called at all. And the reason is that Haskell is lazy enough that it's only going to invoke these functions when they are needed. And if they're never needed, it's never going to invoke the functions. Um, you can kind of figure that out here. But in practice, when you look at non-trivial Haskell code, you're really not going to be able to figure out in which order things happen at all. So you have to write your code in such a way that it doesn't matter in which uh, order things happen. And so that sounds a little bit confusing. And so we might say, what's the point? I, I, haven't we just made something harder for very little return? Well, one of the principal benefits of laziness is that in, it enables much easier composition of functions. And understanding composition of functions allows us to more easily write clear and correct code. 
And I'm going to explain what that means, but first I need to uh, walk you through a little bit of Haskell syntax, just in case you haven't seen it before. Um, in math, I can generally write f o g, and that means the compositions of the functions f and g. So f o g means uh, invoke g and then invoke, invoke f on its result. So in Haskell, I have this dot operator right here, and that's intended to be suggestive of the o that I'd use in math. And so I have a function here called f that adds 1 to its argument and returns that value. I have another function called g that adds 3 to its argument and returns that value. And then I have another function called composed, which takes, an, in, which takes a numeric argument, and it, it, it invokes g and then f, so it's, gonna, it's going to add 4 to its argument. Okay. So if I invoke f of 1, I get 2, and if I invoke g of 1, I get 4, and if I invoke g, you know, f of g of 1, I get 5, and composed is precisely the same thing. Does the syntax all make sense there? That make sense? Anyone not, not follow this? Because you're going to need to understand that dot to go forward. So the huge win of composition is that you can write methods which are simple and correct. So if I want to write a method to find the minimum value in a list of, you know, some numbers, um, I can do that in C sharp. And this does work, you know, if I have a non-empty list, this is going to return the smallest value. There's no correctness problem here. Um, but th there is a problem with this code. And can you figure out what the problem is here? So let's just forget null for a second, because Haskell doesn't have them. So we'll pretend that nulls don't exist. There's another problem with the code. Portable? Sortable? Yeah, it's got to be sortable, and, and uh, C Sharp kind of presumes that to be the case. It's got some, it's got some code in, in the enumerable type that's going to try and do that. And for, <laughs> it, it would probably be better if it wouldn't sort anything, but um, it, it'll sort just about anything you pass to it. The, the problem I have with this code is performance. Um, this, is not, th this will return the minimum, but if I pass it you know, a, a two million element list, it's not going to find that minimum very quickly. Okay. At least not, not compared to a, a, an algorithm that's written specifically for the purpose of finding the minimum. Um, but on the other hand, it's, it's pretty obviously correct, and, and I like that about it. You know, if I, if I was just looping and doing comparisons and stuff, there's a lot of opportunities there to get a greater than, less than uh, sign turned around. So I like the, the obvious correctness of the algorithm, but I, I don't like the performance. The Haskell sort, by contrast, is so lazy that it only finds the smallest and the next smallest elements as we peel them off the list. So composing head, which is the Haskell function that's equivalent to first, and sort actually does produce an optimal implementation of the minimum value of a list. This code will never support the this code will never sort the entire list. And in fact, Calling minimum here is exactly the same as calling head and then sort of some list. There's a downside of lazy evaluation, though, which is that the performance is, it can be difficult, especially in the context of a larger application, it can be difficult to reason about performance. You kind of have to know how this works in order for it to make sense. But truth be told, it's often difficult to reason about performance. You spend enough time with a profiler, and you, you discover that your intuition is very often incorrect on this. But the lazy evaluation does, in many cases, allow me to use function composition to produce code that is both correct and optimal. A good place to learn more is this site called School of Haskell. Um, this allows you to go through some Haskell tutorials and actually execute Haskell code within the web page without having to install anything. The notion of order of operations is even harder in a distributed system. Um, our CPUs these days are not getting a whole lot faster, and um, many programs are going to start behaving as distributed systems, even if they're running on a single computer. So this is a logic problem you may have seen before. Um, there's a farmer who's got a sack of grain, a chicken, and a fox, and he's got a boat which will fit himself in only one of these things. He's got to get them all across the river without anybody getting eaten. Um, I know that a number of you have immediately recognized this as a distributed consensus problem. 
The sides of the rivers are just two different, two different systems, system A and system B. The river represents a possible network partition, and our goal is to prove that given the specification of the problem, there exists an invariant that nobody gets eaten. I'm using this example because it's a lot easier to explain than Paxos. The real problem is that, like many client requests, it might turn out to be impossible. Like, you might have seen this problem, and you might know that a solution to this exists, but if I threw in a cobra and a honey badger, like, now where does this leave us? Is this a solvable problem? I'd like to know if my understanding of the problem is even correct and reasonable before I go ahead and try and solve it. So this is a formal specification of the same problem, in a, of the crossing the river problem, in a language called TLA+, uh, which was created by Leslie Lampert of Microsoft Research. TLA+, allows you to formally define properties of systems that change over time using temporal logic. And one thing that you may notice here is that it's really beautiful. This is a language that's meant to be read more easily than it is meant to be written. Um, TLA+, doesn't implement this code, what it does is it represents your understanding of the, of the problem in a very readable manner, and it, in, it includes um, a model checker which can exhaustively analyze the, the TLA plus model you create and tell you if you have a sensible specification for the problem. So one thing I want to know is, is it possible for the farmer to get across the river? And so what I do is I start with my model, and then I add an invariant that says it is impossible that everybody goes to the other side. And the TLA plus model checker will go and say, no, that invariant does not hold. And here are the steps by which it is necessary to move everybody to get all the animals to the other side without anyone getting eaten. A limitation of TLA plus, though, is that it can only verify the soundness of your model. What it can't do is tell you whether or not your source code implements that model correctly. Still, despite this limitation, simply understanding the model in a distributed system turns out to be very difficult for people. Amazon has used TLA plus specifications in all of their internal protocols for AWS. And as you can see from the table here, just by creating the TLA plus model, they found a number of bugs in the specifications for their systems that would not have fallen out, of the, out easily otherwise. A good place to start is this paper here called The Use of Formal Methods um, at Amazon Web Services, and the link for the paper is in the bottom here. And if you want to know more than that, there's a book written by Leslie Lampert called the TLA plus hyperbook which is a heavily linked PDF document which will walk you through the steps of learning how to, to write your own TLA plus specifications. Still, um, you might want to know, is your implementation, is your implementation correct um, as well as your model? So other people have experimented with other ways of approaching the same problem. I'm going to tell you about another language out of, out of Microsoft Research. You've probably heard of uh, C-sharp and F-sharp, and you might have even heard of F-star, and this is another language called P-sharp. Um, like TLA+, P-sharp formally models a distributed system. It uses state machines instead of temporal logic. But P-sharp is compiled to C-sharp using Roslyn, so the models are executable actually as production code. What you see on the screen is a model of a server. There's two events called ping and pong. And the server, when it's active, if it receives a ping, it's going to send a pong. It's about the simplest client-server system you can imagine. But it does fit on one slide. P Sharp is translated to, uh, via the Roslyn compiler uh, to C Sharp, which is a little more verbose. Uh, it's a little harder to read, but it, it's really not that interesting to just say, oh, I, I have this thing, and it goes to slightly messier C Sharp. What's really interesting is that like TLA plus, it'll explore the entire, it'll exhaustively analyze the entire space of possible states of your model. Um, unlike TLA plus, the way that it does this is by executing your production system. It will directly execute um, your, uh, your production system, but first it attaches a liveness monitor, which makes sure that your system never hangs and, or deadlocks and stops making progress and a safety monitor, which makes sure that the invariants you define on your system are never, 
uh, violated. And then it, then it explores all the possible states of your model. The examples on the screen represent real results from finding errors in the design of this protocols for Microsoft Azure storage services. Um, these things are mostly written in C-sharp and they have had some uh, intermittent bugs which they had been working for about six months to try and reproduce. And even though they knew what happened uh, when the bugs, when, when the software crashed, they were never able to force this, to figure out how the system got into that state uh, to begin with. So after some effort in fitting the Microsoft Azure Storage Services code with a P-sharp specification, the P-sharp model checker was able to find the bug in 10 seconds. And additionally, they were able to find some other bugs. This is the number of seconds of execution to the bug. For the most part, it's sub-second execution to find bugs in the design of the software, and the worst case is 2,000 seconds, which is actually not that bad. If you want to learn more, uh, one place you can start is the P-Sharp homepage. It's, the, this language is close to ungoogleable, but um, I have the URL down here at the bottom. Um, not linked here, though, is I think the best short introduction, which is a technical paper called Uncovering Bugs in Distributed Storage Systems During Testing, Not in Production, and so I've linked that one here separately. I talked briefly before about the problem of trusting online services with data I share. Um, even if I trust the service itself, even if I don't think it's criminals running the service, um, I'm asking a lot of their developers. I want to make sure they don't accidentally leak information to people who aren't supposed to see it. And this, this is somewhat difficult. It's very easy to screw this up. Um, Facebook has a tool that when you see a picture that you think violates Facebook's terms of service, you can report it. And uh, after you report someone for putting naughty things in their picture, it will show you other photos from the same person to see if those might also be ter uh, terms of service violations as well. Um, but the tool did not use to check the privacy settings on the photos before it showed you the subsequent, uh, the, the subsequent pictures from the same person. And someone figured this out, and so they went and found one of Mark Zuckerberg's public pictures and reported it as pornography, and then it was treated to all of his private pictures as well. And, you know, this is the sort of thing that makes headlines for your company. So how can we make sure we never ma make a mistake like this? I'm going to tell you about a system that's designed to present this, prevent this sort of thing called Jeeves. And Jeeves is a, a domain-specific language that can be laid over Scala and Python and potentially other languages as well. So here's what Jeeves does at the most basic level. Here's a, here's a test right here. And there's a calendar application, and Alice is holding a surprise party for Eve. When Alice looks at her event on the calendar, it should have the title Eve Surprise Party. If Eve looks at the same event on the calendar, it should say private event. That's the specification of our system. Now, how do we make sure that even if I take the data from that event and transform it through all kinds of functions to, you know, summarize someone's weekly schedule, I want to make sure that Eve never sees the private data. So the first thing I do is I start with a standard Django model. Um, then I add some additional code to indicate when the model is private. So if I am a guest or a host of the party, then I should be able to see the private details of this event. Otherwise, I return true, indicating that it's a restricted event here. Finally, I add another method to say, what is the anonymous view on this event? So by de the, a, non, a privileged user, one who's allowed to see details of the event, can just see and perform computations on the fields in the model. Um, but I have to say, how should this event appear to people who are not allowed to see the details of the event? So in this case, it just returns the string private event. Again, flipping back to the test, we can see that the Jeeves runtime, in fact, does make sure that, that Alice can see her own details and, and Eve cannot. The, the basic idea here is that the code that enforces privacy should be a very small, very understandable layer of your application. Normally, when we do computations on data, we might have bits of, bits of code throughout the application that are going to say, well, if you combine two calendar events, then this is what you're allowed to see. And 
On this page, certain people can't see one thing or the other. Um, the design of Jeeves is such that you should be able to keep all of this code in the same place and just have one place in your application where you look to make sure that privacy is correctly enforced. To learn more, go ahead and look at the jeeveslang.org homepage. So the question of what's a fundamental data type might sound a little strange if you normally work in like Java or JavaScript or C Sharp because to the extent that those languages have a fundamental data type, it kind of seems to be like maybe null or undefined. Um, the data types provided in languages like C and C Sharp are sufficiently underspecified, which is to say you can throw pretty much whatever you like into them, that it's sort of difficult to think of them as having a, a fundamental data type at all. So we have these really boring arguments about whether enforcing them at compile time or runtime is a good idea at all. But many other languages are built around a more specific data type that permits making functions that work on a broad range of values. And more importantly, a powerful type theory allows the compiler to assist the programmer in producing correct and expressive code. So I'm going to tell you about a language called Idris. And this isn't what I would consider really idiomatic Idris code, but I'm trying to make it uh, understandable to developers who typically work in other languages. And I've also written it to demonstrate a very specific point, as you'll see in a second. Um, I want to write a function to compute a list of averages. This, is, this average function takes as its argument a list of integers, and it's going to return a double. And there's some casting here because Idris doesn't do uh, implicit conversions to data types, but, you know, the implementation's unsurprising. I sum the list and I divide it by the number of element, elements in the list. It's just an average. And the problem I have here, though, is that um, a list can be empty. And if I call the average function with an empty list, well, there is no definition of average for an empty list. It, it's really the wrong data type. What I need is something that, that can only be a non-empty list because my function is really not, not defined over the, the notion of an empty list. And if I execute this, I get not a number. I'd like to fix this. I'd like to force the developer. So most languages can stop me from, or most statically typed languages can stop me from passing the wrong type of argument, but they can't stop me from passing incorrect values. So they can't force me to check the preconditions for the function. I want to be able to force the, the, the uh, person who uses my function to check that precondition before they call it. So in Idris, I can add an additional argument here. And the curly braces here mean that the additional argument is implicit. It has to be figured out by the compiler instead of explicitly passed. And what this says is I need a proof that the list is non-empty. And so if I change nothing else, um, what happens is that even though I'm starting with a non-empty list, I pass it as an argument to a function without any constraint on the contents of the list. And then when I call average, the compiler says, sorry, I cannot find a proof that this list is non-empty, which translates to, you know what? You haven't checked that. So let's go ahead and add the check. Um, I'm going to add a, a uh, this is essentially a switch statement in Idris, and I'm going to say, if the list is empty, I'm going to return the string that you're not allowed to take the average of an empty list. And if I have shown the list to be non-empty, then I'm going to call average. And when I, when I compile that, the compiler is able to figure out that I have tested the list for non-emptiness before I called this. And I can do the same thing with other conditions, like dividing by zero. The Idris, the Idris compiler can figure out at compile time that I never divide by zero. And that turns out to be a very useful characteristic if I'm trying to keep that type of error out of my application. Um, Idris actually does a whole lot more. I don't have time to talk about all of its features, but there's a really good book in progress. This is a MEEP uh, Manning Early Access program. And um, the, the, the theme of this book is type-driven development with Idris. So, you may know in languages like C Sharp and F Sharp, we can often write code um, and infer the type signature. So in C Sharp, you have var, and in F Sharp, it'll even infer the type signature of a function given an implementation. Idris actually works the other way. You can write the type signature for a function, and then with hotkey support in the editor, it will infer the implementation of the function. It writes the function for you based on the type signature, because you can be sufficiently precise and your specification of the type signature is to make that possible. It's a really neat thing to see. 
But you might be thinking, you know, if I write incorrect code, just failing to compile seems like maybe, maybe not strict enough. I, 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 I really don't like incorrect code, and I just want it out of my system altogether. So here's another language called Vigil. And Vigil it takes, starts with standard Python, and it adds two additional statements called implore and swear. Implore checks the preconditions for a function, and swear checks the postconditions. And as you can see here, we've been a little less than careful with our implementation, and this post condition is likely to fail. Um, I think it goes without saying that throwing an unhandled exception is something I never want to happen in my software. So the vigil runtime is going to make sure that I don't violate any of these contracts. So let's go ahead and execute this code. The ever vigilant watchers of your code have found malfeasance in, def say hello, crime raised error which was not caught. Each has been dealt an appropriate punishment. This is not your standard compiler error. <laughs> Whatever could it mean? I'm going to run a git diff here. And here's what happened. Uh, Vigil has deleted from the source code the offending method. <laughs> of course, we have this innocent function here. And it's not so innocent anymore. It's now calling an undefined function. That's a problem. So it's gone now, too. Um, what happens next? There's not much left to delete, is there? Well, the problem is we still have an exception. And the only reasonable thing for Vigil at this, to do at this point is to delete itself. Because <laughs> all errors must be punished. <laughs> the best place to learn about Vigil is the GitHub site. This is actually a, an experiment that was done for something called the Programming Language Theory Games in 2013. Um, there's an article about it in Wired as well, but to hell with Wired. Um, what if the computers of the future aren't silicon? And I'm not going to say too much about this because I'm starting to get into things that, to be straight with you, I don't understand. First, I'm going to talk about uh, quantum computing and then biological computing. They're weird machines. Um, you might have heard of language-integrated query, and now we have language-integrated quantum operations, or LIQUID. The uh, acronym is a little bit of a strain, but it's a domain-specific language and a runtime for simulation of quantum computing on classical hardware. There's a, there are some good reasons to believe that quantum computing hardware is possible. Uh, we think that it might actually happen in nature in some cases. Um, but we do not really know how to build a good, working, high-performance quantum computer yet. People are working on that problem. But at the same time, other people are asking the question, if such a computer did exist, how would we program it? There's some, there's some interesting things that you can do with a quantum computer. One of the things that we know that you could do if you have a quantum computer is take the product of two very large prime numbers and factor them quickly. And if you know anything about RSA encryption, well, now we have a problem for crypto systems because RSA encryption is based on the idea that that is a difficult problem. The, what you see on the screen here is the liquid implementation of something called Shor's algorithm. And Shor's algorithm, if given a quantum computer, can quickly factor the product of large primes. So we can simulate the hardware and run quantum algorithms on it, albeit much, much, much slower on classical hardware. How slow? Well, typically, when you run a simulation of Shor's algorithm, you're factoring numbers like 15, um, which is the, the product of the two smallest odd primes. And it doesn't go quickly. So on a simulation, we know the algorithm does work, but it, it runs very, very slowly on a simulation. Um, but the idea here is that while the quantum computers are developed, we can go ahead and try and figure out what kind of programs we'll be able to write when they are available. And even more important is, right now, we want to be able to say, how can we develop quantum-resistant crypto systems so that when quantum computers do exist, stuff we've encrypted today won't suddenly be decryptable. Uh, Liquid is not easy to Google. Um, there, there's a, a bit of a, a quantum computing pun in the title here. 
but these symbols make things a little bit difficult. Um, but if you just go to Station Q, or if you Google Station Q, uh, you'll find much more about the liquid system, and they have uh, time, from time to time contests uh, that, you can use, that you can enter if, if you're into this stuff. Um, Kappa is one of a number of a growing family of what are called rule-based languages, and my first professional programming job was to write simulations of nuclear physics experiments that were happening at Brookhaven National Labs. And what we would do is we would perform statistical analysis on real experiments, and then we would also use models that the theorists came up with um, to see how the models behaved, and then we would compare the results of those two experiments to see, do the, do, do the reality of the real world and, and the theory, do they agree? So one use uh, of a system that models biological processes is, you can say, is my understanding of the biological processes correct? Another use of this system is if you have what you believe is a good model, you can run biological processes in your computer much faster than they happen in, in nature. So Kappa allows you to define the constraints of your biological process as you understand them and run simulations over those models. Kappa programs simulate biological processes. To learn about Kappa, uh, you can go to the KSIM home development homepage and if you understand a whole lot more about biology than I do, um, you might find this a useful system to look into. So, what have we learned? There are a lot of interesting languages in the world that you can play today that look nothing whatsoever like the languages you use in your day job. But if you spend an evening or two learning about some of these things, I think you'll come away with, a, with an approach to thinking about computation, which is maybe a little bit different than, than what you've used in the past. And this is a way that you can get the most significant upgrade at all, which is an upgrade in your head for how you think about the problems that you solve on a day-to-day -day basis. That's what I have for you today. If any of these things are interesting and you want to chat more, I'd love to get in touch with you. There are varieties of ways you can reach out to me here. Um, Twitter, email. Um, I'm involved with a group in town called Papers We Love Columbus, where we talk about interesting research coming out of the formal computer science community. Um, you can download my slides on this link right here, and I do uh, write about some of, some of these languages from time to time on my blog, which is linked there as well. Um, we have about five minutes before the end of the session, so if you have any other questions you'd like to ask, you can raise a hand now, or you can just come back down and chat with me down here at the podium. Thanks a lot for coming out, and I hope you found this interesting today. Thank you.